I welcome you to my home. Do come in, have a seat. I have something here to relax you. I think you'll find it quite a treat. If you find me sounding insane, it's just the absolute talking. Welcome to another episode of It At, and this one's going to be just kind of a short, fun one to keep us primed for Battery Investor Day, and to talk a little bit about some questions that I've been fielding uh, both online, but mostly uh, in questions that friends uh, have been asking um, about a lot of different things, really, that uh, revolve around uh, the new Tesla batteries. Let's go ahead and... Uh, say that uh, it seems at this point that Tesla is pursuing two avenues simultaneously. One of them being uh, Jeff Dunn's million mile battery. And then the other, it seems that they are trying to accelerate a very large presence in Austin, Texas. And the million mile battery, that's getting uh, a lot of traction right now. Uh, the company CATL is streamlining manufacturing let's say and they're doing that again we did a video earlier on this where we, we touched on it where they're going to be integrating the batteries into the pack to a greater degree and again they're going to be probably going away from not probably they are going away from a cylindrical cell in these batteries and they are trying to more densely pack them uh, the company that they chose actually it has a core competency in making the pouch type prismatic cells and I think that what we're going to be seeing out of that well again not so much think but we know because we're getting some um, feedback uh, from that that uh, they're going to more efficiently use the space and also the manufacturing process by integrating the batteries into the module that goes into the car. Basically trying to skip manufacturing steps that are not really necessary. Uh, so that's a huge leap forward as far as the efficiency of the plant. Uh, there's also some talk about going to a, a new style, larger circumference uh, uh, cell, round cylindrical cell. Uh, I won't go into to uh, too much on that right now because there's still some speculation about size and that kind of a thing. Uh, and then obviously we've been talking before quite a bit about the expansion into the Austin, Texas area. The fact that Tesla has been working back and forth with, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Goodenough and, and Dr. Braga uh, with the uh, glass battery, the solid state uh, batteries. And one of the things that's just recently hit the news is that uh, Elon Musk seems to be now upgrading the size of the uh, facility that's going to wind up being in Austin, Texas. And not only is he now saying that it's uh, going to be a larger factory even than a gigafactory, but that it's also the... Um, it's also going to be producing by the end of the year. Now, what it's going to be producing, that's really kind of up to speculation, but it just doesn't seem to me that that's going to be 100% vehicle related. It seems to me that when they say that they want to be producing by the end of the year, the one thing that they seem to be short on is spare, pay, spare space to manufacture batteries. And so I'm thinking that they're going to wind up using equipment from Maxwell Technology, High Bar, uh, and uh, uh, possibly even other, uh, other partners to, uh, uh, to get in there. And I think that they're going to wind up trying to produce their own batteries in Austin, Texas by the end of the year. And will they do other stuff there at that facility as well? Yeah, probably. I mean, if they're looking at an area to expand into, there's no reason to think why they wouldn't be making their 
Tesla Semi there, the Cybertruck there, the Roadster there, any number of, uh, of things that they just don't have space for at Fremont. And really, from what we hear about Fremont, they don't have much space left to do anything left at, uh, at Fremont. But uh, again, let's get back to the barn burner of a, uh, of a title for this video. Uh, for those that are new to this channel and, and some of the videos that we do, I'm going to be making some judgment calls uh, in, in what I say. And these aren't just somebody spouting off, nor are they even just a, a, a process engineer spouting off. They are the considered opinion of somebody who's actually lived this now for over a year. And so before commenting uh, in disagreement, and again, it's fine if you disagree, that's great. I'd love to hear those comments. But before you comment in disagreement, at least familiarize yourself with the Energy Sovereignty Project. This is a project that we did all last year where we examined in great detail everything that I'm about to talk about now. And so one of the questions that I've been fielding a lot is about the Battery Investor Day and a video that Jeff Don produced a while back that was immediately pulled. And that was what got everybody's attention. Oh, you know, why did they take it down? And, and the thing that he mentioned in there that several people have kind of latched on to is that they were discussing the ability, the newfound ability of this million mile battery and also their solid state battery, they'll both be able to do this, to support what's called vehicle to grid. And that is, for those who aren't familiar with it, where you're able to charge your car to drive it, but then if it's connected to the grid, you can also then take power from the vehicle and put it back into the grid. Well, sounds fantastic on the face of it. And they, they're speculating that the, the, that's going to be one of the major announcements at Battery Investor Day. The fact that they have made these batteries now so tough that you'll be able to exercise them in that way. The problem currently, obviously, is that you have a certain number of miles, let's, to use their term, uh, you have a certain number of miles on that battery, and if you're allowing that car to be used by the grid, where it's continually charging and discharging from grid power without driving, you are using up the lifetime, the, the lifespan of that, uh, of that battery. And what Jeff Don has been doing is he has been working on additives for the electrolytes. They've been working on new materials for the cathodes. Uh, for the, the cathode and the uh, um, anode on the, on the battery, the electrodes, um, they have now gone to what they refer to as uh, possibly as a tabless battery, which means that you can now uh, charge and discharge the battery perhaps more rapidly because you're not trying to send that charge all the way through an entire wound battery. You're now able to um, do it from sections within the battery and so that hopefully too will uh, be one of those things where it will extend the life cycle uh, of the battery and the buzz is that they have extended this life cycle to the point where that amount of usage where you can do vehicle to grid charging is now something that is cost effective and again the thought being that by allowing the utility to do that that they will then pay you a premium for that ability. Because what that means then is that they don't have to build peaker plants and, and that type of a thing to be able to handle the ebb and flow of, of how a grid operates through periods of the day or uh, if they do wind up you know, losing some wind power suddenly or losing something else that, that you can then tap into for a short period of time, this aggregate of vehicle batteries. Okay, well, Here's where we may wind up being in some amount of disagreement. Not total, but some. And that is that I don't think it's useful. I, I think that vehicle to grid is not something that is uh, worth even considering. Now, the reason for that is what we've experienced all through this last year and some logic as well. 
why do you own a car or why does a vehicle exist? Because again, part of this moving into the future is for there to be fewer vehicles. If we are having autonomous vehicles, we are removing to a great degree that incentive for you to actually have to own a vehicle yourself. So let's just say that you have an aggregate number of vehicles whose purpose is to transport people from one place to another. Well, that's the purpose of the vehicle. It's not a gasoline tank where you can just add and subtract power. Now, you could do it quickly if the battery was hooked up to a DC fast charger. In that instance, you can do what's called a DC to DC charge, and those can occur very quickly, as you've seen with the amount of power that can be put from a Tesla supercharger into the vehicle, very rapid. The problem is, is that people don't have those at their house. And so you are limited to the amount of power that the car can supply to the house. So in our usage of the vehicle all through the Energy Sovereignty Project, the only time that I ever got into a situation where I would want to do that was less than a handful of times where I put too much power to the car and we had stormy weather and I didn't have to drive anywhere and I wish that I could have had 30 kilowatt hours of what I put into the car back. That is the only time that vehicle to grid was ever useful to me. Now, before you start to absolutely crucify me in the comments, let me clarify that the ability to do that is still very important. It just isn't going to be used from vehicle to grid. But if you enable a vehicle to go from vehicle to grid, you probably have all of the software components and hardware components that are there to be able to charge vehicle to vehicle or to be able to charge something like an electric skateboard or an electric bicycle, uh, other appliances and whatnot that are, that, are within the, that are within the vehicle to transfer power in that way. Now that will be incredibly useful, but does, does that necessitate a major announcement of, you know, they might be, they, they might still do that, but I think that that isn't going to be anywhere near as, uh, as useful on a day-to-day -day basis as perhaps transferring from vehicle to vehicle. But the Energy Sovereignty Project, we have 90 kilowatt hours of battery in our house. And if you make those batteries, the million mile batteries, in other words, a battery that has, instead of a, uh, a cycle time of 12, 1,200 cycles or so, now you have it 9,000, 15,000. In the case of the solid state batteries, they're talking about 20, 23,000 charge, full charge, discharge cycles before you have degraded the, the battery life to, to any degree. Now, in that instance, when you have that amount of power going into a home battery, each of those Tesla power walls they are capable of delivering power at five kilowatts to the grid. So should we need to, should the grid have a need of that power? Now at five kilowatts per power wall, they have tapped into a substantial amount of power that they could then use for the grid. So while I don't feel that vehicle to grid is ever something that's really going to be terribly useful, because it just doesn't fit the use profile of, of what we have a vehicle for, the home batteries certainly does. And that goes to what I'm going to close this out with, and that is something else that has hit the rumor mill. I've heard it now from enough different sources that I think that it's pretty much gospel, so we'll go ahead and make a prediction. On Battery Investor Day, they're going to be announcing a much larger power wall and that the, um, 
limitations that we see with the current Powerwall product where one of my initial complaints with the Powerwall, if you'll remember, is, is that the amount, the, 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 the capacity of a single Powerwall was too small. You have um, uh, 15 kilowatts of, of kilowatt hours of, of battery storage in one Powerwall, only a little over 13 kilowatt hours of that per Powerwall is usable, and you're not going to be able to power a house on one of them. Well, what I hear is, is that they're going to be making a new version of the Powerwall that's 20 kilowatts. And so certainly two of those will now suffice to not only power most homes, but also have enough of that surplus, as you saw in the Energy Sovereignty Project, to actually be able to put a fair amount of power away for a day uh, so that when you come back in, you're not having to tap into the grid to charge your car. Three of them most certainly, even if you have maybe even two uh, vehicles. And so then the case comes in, how big did they make the uh, inverter for the power walls? Is it capable again of having enough poop to power an entire house? Because that is the major hurdle not just the capacity of a single power wall, but at 5K per power wall, most homes will easily exceed 5K under most circumstances. So you're going to need at least two or three of them just to be able to power all of the loads in your house so that you can shift all of those loads from, so you don't have to have any emergency loads. You don't have any circuits in the house that won't work. Everything can be then run off of your power walls. And so I just thought that that might be a little uh, uh, fun thing to bring to you all while we await the Battery Investor Day. Uh, and also we can raise a glass to Bob and Doug as they are getting ready to return to uh, uh, space on from U.S. soil. That's very cool. And uh, I wish SpaceX all the luck uh, in managing to get them there safely and in a fantastic new ride. And so hopefully uh, uh, all of you are going to follow along with that when they finally go. And uh, as always, thanks for joining us. And I wish you the best of luck with your own systems. And let's keep watch for this Battery Investor Day and see what they have to show us. <music>